everyone. Welcome. My name is Paige. I'm at Deschutes Public Library, and we're here for a wonderful writing workshop with Kristen Dorsey and Central Oregon Writers Guild. All right, Mike, why don't you go ahead Thanks. and take it away? Thanks, Paige. Um, so I'm going to do a quick screen share here and show you our website. Um, so this is the landing page of the Central Oregon Writers Guild website. Uh, mostly this page shows events, uh, our events that are coming up, our, our Central Oregon Writers Guild meetings and workshops, and then other events that we know about in Central Oregon. So here we are in July and there's Kristen who will be speaking tonight um, before she got her new cool glasses although those were cool glasses too. Um, so, we're, so here we are on the 13th. So we've got some things coming up. This is a class at COCC, Get Paid to Write. We've got some readings. Uh, some of these are from Sun River. Some of them are from um, Roundabout Books. Our Blank Pages Writing Salon is this Saturday. Uh, another author, this is live at Sun River. Um, Novel writing is, I believe, live. Um, I'm not sure if it's live or not, to tell you the truth, but that's Kat Mattingly, one of our board members, who's going to be teaching fiction and memoir, up, uh, and that's a multi-week course. Teen writing, if you've got a teen who's looking to, to get into a writing group, uh, this is at Pilot Butte Neighborhood Park and also on Zoom. Kim Cooper Feindling is going to be reading and there's a live poetry slam at the commons so this will be fun to get back into those live uh events I'm, I'm looking forward to it and then introduction to screenwriting and is that that's you denise right yeah but it's canceled there yeah. it's going to be in person in the fall okay so, that so i will um there. i'll yeah you can take i'll that address off. that okay and then the Willamette Writers Conference is coming up uh, online this year, July 29th to August 1st. And then the Pacific Northwest Writers Conference is coming up in September. Uh, we have Jason Graham coming to speak with us still. We're gonna, this is our last Zoom one in August with Jason. Uh, and we'll also have a Zoom workshop with Dina Chadwell. There is room in that workshop. So members $10, non-members 25. These, uh, if you're not a poet and you are a writer, these things are enormously helpful uh, for your writing. My writing, I know, has has gotten better. My, my lyrical writing, my sensory writing, my imagery, my metaphor, all of that sort of stuff that I use in my, in my prose, a lot of that has come from poetry workshops. And I'm very fortunate to be uh, married to a wonderful poet and uh, who helps me a lot. But I think that whether you want to write poetry or not, learning some of the skills from poetry really, really apply to your prose writing, whether you write fiction or nonfiction. Uh, Jamie Houghton, this is our first live class in, or our live workshop, and I'll get rid of that Zoom link there. We've got Ellen Santacero in October, Sarah Sear in November. Got another workshop with uh, Geronimo Johnson, who is my mentor in my MFA program. Uh, fantastic instructor, has a PhD in pedagogy, great writer. This will be a really great thing. And then we'll uh, end the year with our uh, holiday reading in December. Past virtual meetings are available here. If you want to go back and look at one of the meetings, great presentations over the past year during the pandemic. So all of those are available there. All right. Um, let's move on to our featured reader coordinator, Mary Krakow, and she's going to introduce our reader tonight. Thank you, Mike. Um, before I introduce our reader, uh, I would like to tell you that we do, a, every month we have a featured reader, and um, I have featured readers for the next three months, for July, August, and September, but I will need readers for October and November if you're interested. You can put something in the chat box or you could email me marykrakow at gmail.com. Um, and then in December, we always have a, everybody can, every, we have several readers. Uh, last year, I think we had 10 or 12 and that was most of the meeting. So think about 
doing that because I will be contacting you. Okay. Um, also, if you have any, um, if you have a, a book coming out or something like that, this is a good opportunity for you to kind of introduce it to the membership by doing a featured reader reading. Okay. Um, tonight's featured reader is Linda Sather. And um, after graduating from the University of California, Santa Cruz, Linda ventured north to Alaska, the last frontier, looking for money, love, and adventure. Not necessarily in that order. She ended up settling in Fairbanks where she worked in communications and public information for the public, excuse me, for the Fairbanks North Star Borough School District and Alaska Pipeline Service Company. Linda has hunted, fished, worked, and played all over Alaska and in many mostly warm places around the world. Now retired, she splits her time between Fairbanks, where her son and his wife live, and Central Oregon, where she enjoys hiking, making new friends, and playing pickleball instead of the Alaskan sport of curling. So welcome, Linda. We look forward to hearing what you have to read for us today. Mary's part of, or I'm part of Mary's writing critique group here in Redmond, so she's heard earlier versions and helped me on it. Um, I thought that my fellow aspiring writers might appreciate the short blurb, which I call Query Hell. Yippee for me. Last fall, I finally finished the novel, begun five years and a thousand miles ago, before my son left for college and I left for a fresh start in another state. Writing it in the solitude of my new home was a welcome escape, a dream really. Now I'm trying to get it published. What a nightmare. I was supposed to get published by finding a literary agent whose field of interest matches my great Alaska novel. Yeah, right. I think I've spent as much time on my query letter as on the entire 350 page novel. Instead of getting an agent, so far all I've gotten is depressed. Every morning I play a little game with myself. Would I rather clean the toilet or compose a query letter? Sweep under the bed or send a query? Call moldy food from the fridge, pay overdue bills, or do anything other than write another futile query letter. Unfortunately, the bathroom is now spotless, the dust bunnies vanquished, and let's just say food poisoning is not on the menu anytime soon. I'm sitting at my desk, not looking out the window, wondering if a hummingbird will fly by. I am not thinking about what to have for dinner, mm, stir fry with chicken, or how little is left of the bank account, $229.56. I can tell most of the agents are millennials with names like Jessica, Ashley, and Jennifer. Half the names that should have a Y at the end have a double E-E, -E, Marie E-E, -E, Amy E-E, -E, Emily E-E. -E. If the name should end with an E, it's been changed to a Y. Jackie, Katie, Leslie. There's a Chloe, which rhymes with bok choy, which maybe I should put in my stir fry tonight. Or did I throw it out? Never mind. Cindy spells her name with both a Y and two E's. C-Y-N-D-E-E. -E. She's obviously very confused. I'm not querying her. Candy with two E's. Candy. That reminds me there's a bag of M&Ms hidden in the freezer. Time out. With the taste of chocolate now melting in my mouth, not in my hands, I return to the desk. Anne, Anna, Anna, Annie, even an Annie, A-N-N-E-E, -N -E. I kid you not. And where are the male agents? Off writing wine labels, I guess. Whimsical yet weighty, with a whiff of plum underscoring an insouciant blend of herbs, married to a boldly flavored, well-crafted, yet lush textured Cabernet. Is it too early in the day to start drinking? Some of the agents think they can fool me with their unisex name, Jordan, Carrie, Kelly, but I know. I've studied their photos. Very few, male or female, look over 30. What happened to the seasoned agents who might actually connect with my story? Buried under a deluge of queries, I suspect. If these young agents would spend more time reading my submission and less time inventing silly ways to spend their name, I would probably be published by now. But wait, maybe I would have more luck if I changed the spelling of my name from plain old Linda with an I to Linda with a Y 
or Lindy with two E's, or both, L-Y-N-D-E-E. -E. I open a blank document on the computer, pour myself a glass of wine, and begin writing anew. Once upon a time in an urban, gothic, paranormal, alternative universe, there was a marginalized, neurodivergent, hope punk transvestite vampire fleeing a drug cartel's animatronic drones while enlisting dolphins to help him, her, it search for the utopian kingdom of Atlantis, rumored to be the last remaining bastion of dark chocolate in the galaxy. The luck, a hummingbird. The end. Nice, Linda. I appreciate how much wine and chocolate is involved in writing query letters. And I would uh, absolutely read the rest of uh, that piece. If uh, how, much, how much of that do you have written? That's it. Yeah. Well, we, I think you should work on that one. Yeah, thank you. All right. Good job. Thank you very much. Um, so Kristen Dorsey. Uh, is a professor in the humanities department at Central Oregon Community College and a colleague and dear friend of mine. She is a generalist, which means that she teaches a variety of academic and creative writing classes, along with literature classes from early American literature to children's literature. She used to read and write a lot, and then she had twins, which she's in the process of potty training right now. Uh, another discussion of M&Ms. Uh, she, and now she draws lots of circles and reads a lot of Mr. Brown can moo, can you? Teaching creative work, write, writing workshops in the community keeps her excited about her own writing and that of others. And I have had the pleasure of joining Kristen in creative writing workshops. And um, I think she's possibly one of the best instructors uh, I've ever come across. And I'm really looking forward to this session this evening. And so without further ado, here is Kristen. Oh, that's really, really hard to live up to. Like, thanks a lot. Way to set me up for success, buddy. All right. Um, so let me share my screen first and then, and then we'll start talking. Uh, I always have to talk myself through this, even though I've been teaching on Zoom for over a year, I still have to talk myself through the process of here we go. Uh-oh, sorry. Let's try this. Okay, can you all see it? Are we good? Okay, perfect. Um, so first of all, I have to apologize for the fact that I am not a uh, PowerPoint whiz. And so this is not, there's nothing interesting on the slides themselves. They're very uninteresting, but we're here for mostly content. So I hope the content is going to make up for the relatively boring PowerPoint. Um, I want to thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate it. It's really nice to see familiar faces who I haven't seen in a while um, because having twins and COVID pretty much take you out of the world. And um, also people I don't know and haven't seen before. I'm glad to, glad to make your acquaintance and I'm excited to be here. So tonight we're going to talk about hermit crab, the hermit crab technique. Um, there, this is a form that's associated with creative nonfiction writing um, and, a per, and particularly creative nonfiction essay writing. However, um, and, and, pr and probably even more than that, it's associated with memoir, with short memoir pieces. But I'm hoping that I can convince you fiction writers that this is also a good and useful technique for you. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the, in the, in the talk tonight. And I'm assuming that if you're, a, if you're a poet, this is already gonna feel familiar to you um, because you're already interested in form and it's your bread and butter or your bread or butter, depending on how you look at it. So I think, I think for poets, there's kind of a natural affinity for thinking about uh, the hermit crab concept. So let's uh, start with defining the hermit crab essay. The term was coined in Brenda Miller and Suzanne Pilla's Tell It Slant writing and shaping creative nonfiction, which does not look like this anymore because they updated it. There's a third edition, this is a second edition. This is a tremendous book, um, just generally, if you're interested in creative nonfiction. But also I would say that um, it's a must for anybody who's looking for prompts because they have tremendous prompts at the end of every chapter. And it's one of my favorite books to go to for prompts because they're really well thought out prompts, complicated and well thought out. Um, so this book came out in about 2013 and that's when 
Miller and Pella kind of um, coined the phrase uh, hermit crab essay. And what is a hermit crab essay? It's basically a form precedes content technique for writing. In other words, you choose a form and then you put content into that form, right? You borrow a form from some, someplace else and you place content within it. So it uses a recognizable form and usually it's a form that's non-literary. So think personal ads or uh, obituaries or um, receipts. I mean, anything that you can think of that's kind of non-literary, but is sort of a written form that has its own language, its own conventions, et cetera. So usually you're gonna choose the form before you choose the content, or there's gonna be a choice about form very early on in the process. So it's using a recognizable form along with its conventions. So in other words, you use all of the, the conventions of that form and you use the language of that form as a shell for the nonfiction content, which is often memoir. And the interesting thing about this um, is that a lot of people talk about the importance of the concept of protection. So why does a hermit crab move from shell to shell? Well, it gets bigger and it's got to get a bigger shell, right? But why, does, why do hermit crabs use the shells? They use the shells to um, protect their relatively soft and vulnerable bodies. So the idea of the hermit crab essay is that it's a shell that's protective of very sensitive content. And we'll talk in a few minutes about the ways in which it, it does that protection, but you'll hear me use the word protection multiple times, I think, tonight. Um, so let's talk about some benefits of using the technique. So probably the, one of the greatest benefits here is that it provides critical distance between writer and content. In other words, because you have this form, which is often in second person or third person, that distances the writer from very personal writing and from very personal content. So if you're talking about content that's extraordinarily difficult to talk about, that's very personal, that's very sensitive, then this provides kind of a wall between reader and writer. But it does so without alienating reader from writer, right? Um, so it provides a little bit of that critical distance. It also is a way to spark imagination. So if you have content that you want to write about, um, but you're having sort of a hard time finding your way into it, thinking about putting it into different uh, shells can be very useful. It's also a way to offer a new perspective. So you have content and instead of just coming from it from a personal perspective, it allows you to look at that content from an outside perspective, from a medical perspective, from a, a naturalist perspective, depending on what kind of form you're using. And it's really helpful, just, I should just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay on this for a minute. It's super helpful if you think about it, um, when you're talking about something that's very close to you or very sensitive or something you're very vulnerable about, it's extraordinarily helpful to be able to get, to be able to access that outside perspective on your own content and your own feelings and your own experiences. And it's a, it's a way of doing that without actually getting outside perspective, right? It's a way of sort of imagining an outside perspective. I also like the fact that this restores the feeling of writing as play or puzzle. I think so often um, writing, we can get into ruts where writing feels like an obligation or it feels like a chore or it feels like something that, that we're slaving away over. But one of the things I like about this is that you have a little bit of a puzzle because you have this form and you have this content and you're trying to sort of marry them together. And sometimes you really have to puzzle that out and you have to solve little problems that come up as you're doing it. And so that kind of gives a sense of play to it, which I think is really helpful. This also deepens the content, the connection between form and content. So uh, the form becomes as meaningful as the content, right? It raises sort of the stakes with the form. And so when you are looking at writing a hermit crab essay, you want to make sure that the form is in service of the content and vice versa. There needs to be a real marriage between the form and content. It's not that every everything can be expressed through a personal ad or anything can be expressed through a to-do list. You really have to think about what is the right form to explore that particular set of ideas. And so it deepens that connection. And it also means that meaning can be made between the content and the form which is really interesting.
Um, this also is a form that allows, or a, a technique that allows for evolving communication technologies. And what I mean by that is that think about, and, and in some ways, I, I think as I was thinking about this, I was, I was sort of imagining that a lot of times, and especially the older we are, the, the more this is probably true, a lot of times we become sort of like uh, almost burnt out by the, by the pace of communication changing. Um, and the new forms of communication that are available. So think about all the things that weren't available 20 years ago, you know, Twitter and um, Instagram and Yelp reviews and, right, like all of these are, are relatively new forms of communication. And so one thing that's really nice about the, the Hermit Crab essay is that as new technologies for communication arise, that provides more uh, options for us about forms that we can choose which I think is really fun. And it kind of uh, lightens at least my feelings about the explosion of communication technologies. And then finally, um, and I think for somebody like me, this is really important. It's this suggests an assembly model of composition. So I'm not somebody who feels divinely inspired in my writing. <laughs> um, that's not the kind of writer I am. I also don't think I'm a tremendously imaginative writer. What I do think I'm good at is sort of piecing things together. I'm, I'm good at sort of like um, putting things in communication or in, in connection to one another, um, assembling things from pieces. And this is one thing that is really nice about this kind of technique. You don't have to feel divinely inspired. You can kind of use the form as a way to start to assemble ideas. It gives you a structure, it gives you a backbone kind of literally gives you a backbone. Um, so I think that that's also really super helpful. I'm just looking at my notes to make sure I'm not forgetting something important. Um, one thing I should say here at this point is, and this kind of goes back between that connection, uh, goes back to that connection between form and content. We do wanna be really careful that the form never becomes a gimmick. And there is of course the, the, the potential for that. And that's why it's so important that the form you choose is really connected deeply to the content. And it, and it sort of like, it shows the content in a new light. Otherwise this can feel like a very gimmicky sort of way of approaching your writing. So um, it's not, this is not something that you choose lightly because if you do, I think it becomes kind of gimmicky in a way that I don't, I don't think it, me it means to be or it should be. Um, so that's one thing to kind of watch out for. So Brenda Miller is, she actually wrote the chapter that discusses the Hermit Crab essay in uh, Tell It Slant. And in one of her workshops, she talks about how Hermit Crab essays seemed like they were kind of cutting edge in 2013. Although I'm gonna argue a little bit later that these have been around for a lot longer than 2013. It's just that they got a name in 2013. Um, and so she talks about the fact that between 2013 and, and even 2018, all of a sudden people were writing so many hermit crab essays that it became sort of a traditional form in a very short period of time. And so she talks a little bit about how it's hard to keep that fresh. It's hard to keep it feeling like it's fresh and something new. And so she tells her students that they should they should kind of go through four stages when they're thinking about an essay and thinking about presenting an essay in this way. The first thing is that you should think about inhabiting the form with the voice of the form. So in other words, you wanna use the language, you wanna use the tone, you wanna use the um, syntax of the form that you're choosing, which makes a lot of sense. So for example, if you're gonna write an Amazon review, then you wanna read a lot of Amazon reviews to see what they look like, right? And to get a sense of the rhythm of that writing and the language of that writing. Um, and so that's, that's something to think about. Another thing is to ask yourself why you were using that form. In other words, it goes back to that idea of like, why is this form the right form with this content? What is the connection between this form and this content? Um, think about how to make it not about you, but something bigger. This is by the way, also kind of a baseline thing to remember if you're writing about yourself ever for any reason. So if you write memoir, you should always think about how to make it not about you, but about something bigger. Um, as interesting as we all are in as individuals, we're, it, it's, what, it's, it's how we connect to the universal, right? That's really interesting to readers. 
So think about, you know, in terms of this content and in terms of the way that I'm expressing the content, how is that about something bigger? What, what is the bigger statement that I'm trying to make? And then I love this last idea because um, I don't know about you, but I always struggle with endings and most of the people I know struggle with endings. So this should free you. Um, how do you end the thing? A lot of hermit cram essays just end, stop, without ever reaching something grander or crescendo. In other words, this is a form where you can just literally get to the end and stop. And you don't necessarily have to elaborate or conclude or anything. You hopefully have done a good enough job with the content that by the time the reader gets to the end, they can kind of make that meaning for themselves. So, you know, I'm basically telling you that you get to cross off of your list one of the things that you usually have to do when you write something. <laughs> You don't have to worry about that ending so much. So just to kind of give you an idea of the breadth of these, this, this, this uh, particular genre of writing of creative nonfiction. Um, some examples here are, um, and these are some of my favorite. These, I'm going to show you, I'm going to actually show you a couple of examples in a minute, but I just want to give you an idea of the kinds of forms that people borrow. Um, so Dinty Moore's Son of Green Jeans, an essay on fatherhood is an ABC diarian, which is basically an essay that's organized alphabetically. And so he has um, like headings in alphabetical order and then a little blurb about each one. And what it ends up looking like is it looks a little bit like a, a short dictionary um, or a short encyclopedia. Right. And he has all these really interesting different ideas about um, things that are related to fatherhood. And some of them are super surprising. Some of them are very conventional. And as you read the essay, you kind of get this very wide sense of what being a father means and how Moore is looking at the idea of being a father. Um, so that's one, one example. Um, Lori Easter's piece, Solving My Way to Grandma, is a crossword puzzle. So that it, it begins with a, an actual blank crossword puzzle. And then it's got numbers. And after those numbers, there's a little blurb. And then there is a clue that's related to that little blurb that actually fits into the, to the crossword puzzle. It's very clever. It's very well done. And this is, a, um, this is an example of an essay where you have this hard outer shell you know, this, this, this hard outer, sh outer shell of the, of the crossword puzzle, but the material is actually um, about abortion and choice and people who choose to have babies versus people who don't choose to have babies. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a surprisingly deep read um, because you look at it and you think it's gonna be sort of like a light read and it's not a light read at all. And she does it through these like little tiny fragments. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Um, Emmerich Huey's liner notes from the debut band or from the debut album that the, from the band we never formed is actually liner notes. Um, I think everybody here is old enough or just about old enough to remember liner notes, which are now a thing of the past. Sadly, I used to pour over liner notes in my teenage years. <laughs> I always thought they were the most interesting part of the album. Um, but this is a really fun one because this is kind of about the, 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 the desire to build and then the ultimate disillusion of a band that never goes anywhere and kind of about friendship and how friendship ebbs and flows. And it's really fun. I find that I can't give this to my students because they have no idea what the hell letter notes are. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute because we're gonna talk a little bit about audience and how audience relates to this. Um, Sonia Huber's shadow syllabus uses a college course syllabus as its inspiration. This is an interesting example, and this is this is one that you can find online pretty easily, but this is an interesting example because she doesn't really follow a syllabus uh, exactly. It's more like the, it's more like the, um, the spirit of a syllabus. So it's an interesting one because it, it probably sticks less um, specifically to that, that form, but is very much informed by that form. And then Sarah McCall's OkCupid, okay which is a dating profile Q&A, um, where she takes the questions that OkCupid okay asks you and then she answers them, but she answers them in a way that you would never actually answer them on, a, on an actual profile because you would never get a date. Um, and so that one's, that one's also a really fun one. I also like the fact that this is a relatively short essay. 
it's only about two and a half or three pages and you get such an idea of who this person is and what her problems are with dating, um, why she has issues with dating. And so it's a very interesting little piece. And then finally, um, the last one I'm going to talk about, I'm actually going to show you, um, show you some of, of this particular essay. Um, this is Bill Wessex, um, What Would Journey Do? And he uses the Christian, uh, uh, the, the form of a Christian daily devotional. So at this point, I want to say a few things about audience. Um, one thing to keep in mind if you're going to pursue Hermit Crab essay is that not every form is going to be recognizable to every reader. So you are making some choices about your readers based on the kind of form that you're choosing. So for example, if you have never seen a Christian daily devotional, if that's not something that you've ever run across, this is not gonna make as much sense to you. When I was in high school, my aunt for my birthdays <laughs> got me a subscription all four years of high school to a Christian devotional magazine that came out quarterly. And the idea was that you would read a scenario and then um, the, person writing the devotional would, would sort of talk you through what scripturally is the answer to that scenario, right? How that, how you should be um, led by scripture in terms of how you deal with that particular scenario. And because it was a teen one, it was about things like premarital sex and drinking and, you know, kind of the typical teen things. And um, of course, my aunt didn't understand that, like, I wasn't drinking or having sex to begin with. So I, this was really like a work of fiction for me. Um, but, but it's, but it's an interesting form. The other thing that's kind of can, a little bit, a little bit complicated about this particular one is that you also have to understand journey, the band. <laughs> and if you missed journey, the band, <laughs> if that's not part of your background, this is also not going to make any sense to you. So I am really, I, when I first read this, this particular essay, I thought this man is writing for me because I have read Christian daily devotionals and I love me some journey and pretty much like he wrote it for, I don't know who else is going to be interested, but he wrote it for me. Um, so I want to show you just a, a little uh, snippet of this. And the other thing to kind of just as, as a point of interest is that this particular essay was written, I think in 1998. So again, this predates the um, tell it slant by about, by about 15 years. And so this is just to get, this just goes to show that people have been doing this for a long time. They just didn't call it a hermit crab essay. All right, so this is relatively short. Hopefully it'll be, it'll be amusing to some of you. <laughs> so this is a, an excerpt. Um, it starts out, you've all seen the WWJD bracelets and t-shirts that remind teens and adults alike about a good rule of thumb for living a holy life. Many, however, ask themselves these questions. Does Journey know about my battles with the enemy of my soul? Do they understand the fierce temptations that challenge me? Do they have any clue what I'm going through, the sorrow, the sadness, the depression that overflow my cup? I've been betrayed by a friend, a lover, someone very dear. Does Journey understand? I am here today to tell you that Journey does understand because my friend, Journey has been there before. Also, you have to remember the WWJD wristbands, right? Um, and of course, the J was not really for Journey, it was for Jesus. So situation one, Greg and Heather have a picture perfect marriage. The two are young and wildly successful. Heather is a bank credit analyst. Greg, a top low for salesman at a department store. But Heather's job requires her to work long hours and Greg often feels neglected. If she really loves me, he wonders, why is she away from home so much? And then we get the, the answer. It's the quintessential modern struggle. A two income family overworked, always pressed for time. You may wonder how Journey, who walked the earth so long ago, could relate to a problem like this. But did you know that Journey faced precisely the same dilemma nearly 20 years ago? In Frontiers 5, 48, they tell the story of a musician always on the road and the woman he's left behind. They say that the road ain't no place to start a family, but right down the line, it's been me, you and me. And love and a music man ain't always what it's supposed to be. Oh, girl, you stand by me. I'm forever yours, faithfully. Faithfully. It's clear that Journey intends a double meaning to this term. Faithfulness to the absent spouse, yes, but also faith in Journey and their power to heal broken relationships. And then uh, usually in this kind of writing, you end up with like a little something to, to meditate upon. Devotional meditation. How secure is my faith in Journey? When is it strong? When does it falter? Right. And, and the, 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 the full essay has several more of these um, and it's really fun, but you definitely get a sense of what this looks like just by um, 
just by seeing this. Uh, so, and I in no way am making fun of Christian devotionals, by the way. Um, I think that it's a really clever play on, on that. And if you know any hardcore Journey fans, you know that Journey's albums are sacred texts to those people. So there, there is a, a, a clear and, and very simple sort of connection here between form and content. Okay, so let's do a little bit of thinking and writing here. Um, and so the following two, so we're gonna do two different um, little writing activities, and these are meant to be kind of quick and dirty. The first one starts with form and then moves on to content, okay? And then the second one is starts with content and moves on to form. And these are all, these are both different ways that Brendan Miller talks about how to sort of brainstorm or how to sort of pre-write um, for doing this kind of writing. So I want you to take just a couple of minutes. I'm looking at my time right now. How am I doing? I'm doing okay. Um, take just a couple of minutes and write a list of forms. So be as inclusive and wide reaching as you can. Um, if you'd like, I'd like to encourage you to add an idea or two to the chat area. Um, so if you have a couple of really good ones, you can put them in chat. Not to, not to make you feel anxious, but a book I'll talk about a little bit later, it's this one, it's called The Shell Game, has an index or a, 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 a postscript that has about eight pages full of different forms. So there's lots of them out there, right? Um, but just try and get five or seven different ideas. So I'll give you a minute to work on that. Just forms. Okay, so hopefully everybody's got a little list going. Now, the second part of this is that we're gonna think about the content aspect of it. And again, if you wanna put some of your ideas in chat, that would be great. Um, choose one or two of the forms that you listed or that somebody else has suggested and think about story or content ideas that might pair well with these forms. So think about things that you have thought about writing about before or that you um, have considered writing about but have some trepidation about writing about. And think about, are there any of those stories that you think would pair well with one of these forms? So I'll give you a, just a couple minutes to think a little bit about that and see if you can come up with some pairings.
So did anybody have any sparks of brilliance here? Any good couplings? I'd love to hear if you do. See, when we're in person, I can bring chocolate to entice people to share. But on Zoom, you can't do that. It's like you lose part of your teaching arsenal when you're. So you there's good, uh, Kristen, there's some good stuff in the chat. Oh, is there? I can't. You know what? Yeah. I can't actually see. Wait, hold on. Hold on. I can, I can do this. Hold on. Hold on. Okay, wait. I'm going to stop my share for a minute because it won't let me. Oh, there you go. Oh, the brutally honest obituary. <laughs> that sounds frightening. Oh, I love that idea. Lori, I love that idea of the speeding ticket and the perpetually rushing mom. I love the video game one too. Interesting, yeah. Sales ad for a child who disgusted them. Oh, that's great. Eliza, you know what, that the idea of the recipe for love, that's one that people often gravitate toward. That's what I've heard before. And I think there's something about the way that we want to codify love, right? Um, that, that attracts people to that particular idea. These are great. Yeah, these are, these are great. And there's, you've just given us enough that These are great. If you just you guys have just given me enough that it makes me want to read some of these. I'm trying to I'm trying to imagine Mike the uh, lather rinse repeat and how that relates to divorce. I'm intrigued by that. All right, so um, so that's that's one way of approaching this particular um, kind of writing. A different way of, of of approaching it is to start with content and then think about form. So um, let me pull this back up. Can you see it? Is it showing the whole thing or no? Sometimes my computer does a weird thing. With... Okay. So um, now we're gonna try it again, but we're gonna do the opposite. So I want you to write a list of topics that you're afraid or reluctant to write about. And if these are very painful, then just write down a word or phrase that reminds you of what you were thinking about. So don't feel like you have to be like super autobiographical confessional, but give yourself a little cue about what things you were thinking about. Some people have, have things that they want to write about, but they're so tender about it, they can't even really put it on paper yet. So if you can't, just write something that reminds you of it. So I'll give you, I'll give you a moment. So remember, we're talking about protection here. So what topics do you want to protect that you'd like to write about, but you want to protect? I'll give you a minute for that. Okay, hopefully everybody's got a couple ideas. I always feel bad when I ask people to wallow in the icky, but we'll move on to something a little happier. We'll talk about forms. Okay, now um, pick one or two of these topics and imagine fitting them into a formal home. Which forms might pair well with the content and offer you the protection that's offered by a hermit crab essay? 
So again, thinking about these really tender topics, these really sort of um, soft, vulnerable topics, are there kind of natural forms that might fit with those particular topics and give you that kind of hard outer shell that would allow you to write about them? So because of the nature of this one, I'm not necessarily going to ask you guys to share because you might not feel like you want to share yet, and that's okay. Um, but I am wondering if anybody has any observations about sort of the way that this, that this works. Did this work better to think about content first, or was there something that occurred to you that was different in thinking about content first? I'm just kind of curious. I really liked the second way we did it, the... Uh topic first and then trying to find a form that would make it easier to write about that topic that was that one came more that one flowed more easily for me yeah yeah i think it tends to be kind of 50 50 um that you know some people some people work well thinking about like form suggests something to them um whereas i think some people have to go with content first or they feel sort of like they, they have a harder time sort of coming up with something that way. Um, but I, but I, what I've noticed in workshops is that people tend to be kind of 50, 50 with this one. Anybody else? Yeah. This is Linda. <clears throat> I'll say that, um, the forms, I mean, the word form, it seems somewhat superficial. They're kind of formulaic, whether they're recipes or obituaries or, you know, a fable. And when I think about a couple of topics that are tender to me, they are too deeply emotional to fit into a, what I think of as kind of a whimsical, you know, whether they're liner notes or, or whatever, a more whimsical, superficial story, but maybe I haven't thought about it enough. Well, it's, it's really interesting. There are a couple of great craft pieces. And actually at the, at the end of the talk, I have some, um, some resources. And, and one of them is a uh, Brenda Miller talk has a piece where she talks about how she wrote probably her most famous piece of um, hermit crab. And it's a, it's, it's basically a, a, a bunch of rejection letters. And she starts off with really cute ones about, you know, things like the very first one is about dear 10 year old artist. And, and basically like it's, it's a critique of her art skills at 10, you know, but as she goes on, the topics become sort of darker and darker and she ends up, um, she ends up um, with, by about the middle of the essay with a letter that's from uh, two miscarried children. Um, and basically they were like, you know, um, dear almost mother, um, you know, you, we're sorry, but you know, your body wasn't, I mean, basically, you know, it's, it, it has that kind of like, um, that really dark feeling. And she, she talks about the fact that she wasn't expecting it to go there. So she didn't start that essay thinking that she was going to write about those miscarriages. And, and there are some other, there's some other deeper ones as well that come kind of later in the essay, but she didn't start, she didn't start writing it thinking about that. She was kind of being clever and having fun with it. And it kind of did that turn. So I think that sometimes too, um, if you kind of come up with something and you're playing with it, 
it may not start off feeling like it's um, particularly deep, but it can kind of go there pretty easily. And so I think being kind of open to that and seeing where that where it goes uh, might take you someplace a little bit different than where you thought you were going to start. So that's you know that's that's one thing that I think can can happen in this, with this particular kind of writing. Anybody else? It's great. I mean, great. It's great. I, I get what you're saying totally. Um, but I do think it turns sometimes. Oh my gosh, Paige, therapist notes from your own sessions. That would be a frightening thing to write. <laughs> I think to make that work, I would definitely have to make it not really what therapy looked like for me. It would have to be slightly fictional <laughs> to make that work. That's almost too close. Good. Anybody else have anything that, that kind of occurred to them or questions at this point? Okay. Are y'all hanging in? Good. All right. Um, so let's think a little bit about um, this. But Kristen, I don't want to write a memoir. Uh, sure, you don't have to write memoir. Um, and this is not my, you know, I said, it, I said at the beginning that this is not necessarily uh, a talk that's just for people who want to write creative nonfiction. I wanted to make sure that this was this, this felt re relevant to any of you. Um, and so I have a couple of ideas here. And, and, and this is just a, a getting started point. And if you guys have ideas too, I'd love to hear them. But just, just kind of to get us started, um, here's some other uses for the technique. And I know that I'm using bad PowerPoint uh, technique here because it's got a lot of words, but just bear with me. Um, so the first one is that you can use this as a character study. So for example, let's say that you have a fictional character and you're trying to flesh out some background of that fictional character. You could consider writing a timeline of that character's life. A timeline is definitely a form. It's a form that's the, that has its own conventions, that has its own language. Um, and so writing a timeline of that character's life or to write a daily to-do list that would be typical for that character, those are things that could flesh that character out for you. So if you're having trouble sort of getting at the meat of a character, these are ways you can use these kind of techniques to sort of play around with character and think about what are that what is that character's daily life like or what are what values does that character have or what events in the past have impacted that character, right? Um, another one is uh, adding dimension to fiction. And we've all read fiction like this, right? Um, I just finished, gosh, what is, I can't remember the name of the author. I just finished American Marriage. Has anybody read this? Rebecca, you've read it? I've read all of her most recent books. She's so amazing. That book was a trip. Um, it, it was one of those books where you, where you read it and you think, I've never read any, I've never read this story before. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a really interesting book, especially if you hear her talk about how she wrote it. She actually tried to write it in many different ways before she got to the to sort of the um, the ultimate iteration of the book that ended up being published. And so she played a lot with perspective. But a lot of the novel is epistolary. Um, it's these letters that go back and forth between two characters. So um, we've all seen this sort of thing about integrating text messages, letters, voicemails, love notes between characters into a novel, right? So thinking about how you can take um, other kinds of forms and integrating them into your fiction and sort of adding that dimension or that, that sense of, of reality to the fiction. Um, this, is a, this is a kind of a, a, a more, a stranger one, let's put it that way. Um, and that is if any of you have ever read, and, I would be surprised if anybody actually has read it. The Centaur by um, John Updike, which is a really weird little book. <laughs> um, he actually has an index in that book. So it's a, it's a work of fiction, it's a novel, but it ends with an index, which is real weird. Um, actually, I think it ends with an epilogue, but there's an index right before the epilogue. Um, and the index, both in terms of the topics and the way that they're arranged, emphasizes themes in the novel. And so it's very, it's a very interesting move to add something that does not belong or that we don't think of as belonging to a novel, right? We think of an index as something that belongs to an educational book or to an, a nonfiction book, but he does this really interesting move. And that I think I would consider that almost to be a, a type of hermit crab move. So adding dimension to fiction is another idea. Um, and then finally, 
I was thinking about how this could be an interesting way to deal with narrative problems, right? So um, if you're stuck with how to solve a problem in a narrative, consider using a different form to explore the plot. For example, let's say that you have an event that happens in the novel and you're having a hard time kind of working yourself through that event. Try writing about the event from um, the perspective of the newspaper story. What would a newspaper uh, report of that event look like? And by doing that, you're taking yourself out of the, the novel writing persona, right? And you're putting yourself into the journalist persona and that could actually help you sort of work your way through the event. What happened first? What happened next? Next, who are the important people? It kind of gets you in that who, what, when, where, why kind of mindset, right? Um, another another idea is um, if you have like a, a conversation or a disagreement or something like that between a minor character and a, and a main character, and you're not really sure, like you're not really sure what the reactions of the of the minor character should be. You're not really sure how that conversation would go. Um, write a dialogue between that minor character and a friend of that character who's not in the novel about the event. So have that minor character tell this other person who's off the page what happened. So instead of trying to write the, the actual scene, try and write that person's recollection of the, of the scene and see if that kind of gets you back into the scene. So the idea here, again, is just to kind of play with these techniques to give you a different perspective and to help you kind of work your way out of that problem by changing perspective a little bit. Anybody else have, have ideas about like ways that the technique might be able to, to be used that might be somewhat, that might be different from the ones I came up with? I'm reading Janet's chat right now, hold on one second. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So um, that sounds really, really interesting, actually. Um, yeah, and I think reviews are really, reviews are super fun, I think, super, super fun. Um, <clears throat> I have a, I have an essay, uh, <laughs> yeah, right, Mike. Um, I have an essay that is a, um, a collage essay um, that uses different, um, different forms. And so one of the things in there is an inventory. Um, another thing is a, rev a book review. Um, uh, there are some text messages um, that were actually, the whole thing is about um, my father and my relationship with my father and our relationship to Oregon sports. <laughs> um, so the Blazers and the Ducks and, you know, and so I've used a bunch of different um, forms to kind of um, when you pull them all together, they're all fragments, but when you pull them all together, they sort of are meant to, to kind of give a, a portrait of the relationship. Um, so yeah, I think that, I think that that's, um, you can also use the form to do something purely fictional. It doesn't have to be something that's, that's true. Okay, so one more brief little activity before we wrap. Um, so this is for fun. Consider a fictional character. Um, this could be one of your fictional characters, um, or it can be a character from literature or film or television. It could even be a kind of character, like a film noir detective, right? I want you to consider a normal day in the life of this character. <laughs> so a typical day. Imagine the character begins his, her, or their day by writing a to-do list. Um, yes, even Jack Reacher needs to pick up dry cleaning now and then. I would imagine, right? Um, what items would be on that list and what would the character prioritize? So try writing a list of just like five to eight things that would be on that character's to-do list in a normal day, right? And again, if you don't have one of your own at your fingertips, use somebody else's. I'll give you just a couple minutes for that.
Linda likes my exercise. <laughs> I mean, I'm afraid that people are going to get the wrong idea about your marriage. Or maybe you guys have been in the house for too long together. <laughs> so, yeah, tell me, um, tell me what characters you've used and what you came up with. By the way, I do this with my students. Um, I like to, in the fall, when I have a little bit more time in my classes, I like to do a creative writing day with my writing 121 students. And I try to do it right around midterm, which ends up being um, Halloween. And so one of my activities that I do is this one, and I make them choose a Halloween related character. Um, so I get lots of to-do lists from, you know, witches and vampires and werewolves and it's super fun <laughs> um and really i mean really they come up with really clever things it's, it's really fun for me um to hear them so i'm just curious yeah yeah film noir is fun do you want us to type them or to say them either one i, don't I love hearing voices all right i did harry from when harry met sally oh um Practice funny voices, check baseball park schedule for home games, buy tickets to game, go for a run, watch Casablanca, look for furniture, call back that girl I met on the subway, call Sally. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Somebody's watched it many, many times, haven't they? Oh, maybe a thousand. <laughs> Eliza, I love Yoda because Yoda has such a specific... Um, I, I mean, I'm trying to. I'm trying to think about the language that look, that Yoda's to do list would use, right? Because he's got that weird diction. By the way, it, it, I'm embarrassed to admit this, but I was really old. Like this probably happened about ten years ago that somebody said something, and I realized that the reason that Yoda talks like he does is because he's a non-native English speaker, right? Which which never occurred to me. But the reason that he talks like he does is because he's using syntax from a different language, but he's he's translating it into English. And I was like, how did I miss that? As an English teacher, how did I miss that? It felt really dumb. But but that makes for a fun, a fun to-do list, right? Because you get to play with the language. Good. Anybody else have one that they're particularly proud of? Well, this is Linda. I don't feel like typing, so I'll just read. My protagonist is a 20-year-old leaving for Alaska in 1973. So you have to think of, you know, back yeah. then. So her to-do list is get birth control pills from the free clinic, throw out her old love letters, uh, buy new underwear, and then choose a new color ink to start using in her pen that she writes in her journal. You know what I love about that is that I think that that's another really great way that if you're trying to get yourself into a particular time and place, if you're, if you're sort of going for setting, what a great way to get yourself there mentally, right? Um, because that, that list is going to be really different if it's in 1973 versus if it's in 2021. Right. So I love that idea of using that as sort of a, and think about if you're writing historical fiction, right. Then it becomes even, you know, it becomes even more fun because you can start to think about, okay, well, you know, if I'm writing about the Renaissance, then like, what are people doing in the Renaissance? Right. I think that could be, that could be really helpful. These are great. All right, we're almost done. And then we can chat if you would like to. Um, so let me get back to my thing. Da, 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 da. And um, so I don't, I didn't show this earlier because it's, I find it to be totally intimidating um, because this is genius. Um, this is a writer named Dustin Parson. And this is a piece that he wrote called Drop Off. And so it's very short, so I'm gonna read it to you. Um, I'm not allowed to walk with my son to his classroom. In the effort to assert more independence, children negotiate the hallways themselves, sliding their bags and coats into cubbies. Imagine legs like springs sitting too long, tension like a hammer, parents sulking to cars, first grade a barrel negotiating the rifling. I used to guide him through the twisting halls until our memories triggered the same turns. Do they not want us wandering the halls? a plague of parents grasping at any purchase. I am exploding the gun. I fear walks in instead of me. I cannot continue um, a fear of the dark halls I cannot see. When he walks, the sidewalk blows him to the doors. He is small now. He doesn't turn to wave. It is cool for September. 
what use are the glass doors to the school except to let the light in? Now, the piece itself is fairly strong, um, but what he actually um, paired it with this exploded view of a, hand, a handgun, which he got from a handgun manufacturer. And so you, it's really hard to see in the slide, I know, um, but you could definitely Google this and, and find it and, and you can see a little bit more carefully. But if you look really, if you look really hard, you can see that there's little numbers um, to each of the parts of the gun, the exploded view of the gun. And the numbers correspond to the numbers in the, in the piece that he wrote. And so as you're talking about things like the rifling or the barrel or um, the springs, they actually correspond with the numbers of those pieces of the gun. And um, this one just takes my breath away because of just sort of the, the, the creativity here and what a more, it's such a more haunting piece when you see it next to, next to the image, I think. And when you see the, the numbers next to the image, um, I just think it's a really super brilliant piece. Um, but this is, I think, a, a sort of extreme version of what we've been talking about. Um, exploded view is something that, that comes up in, um, you know, uh, assembly, uh, assembly manuals and that sort of thing all the time. So this is a very distinct kind of uh, genre, a distinct kind of form. And what he does with it, I think, is super, super interesting. I wish I'd thought of this. This is one of those ones I, I'm just like, damn you, Dustin Parsons. Make me think I'm, I'm just never gonna be that good. Um, so I have a couple of suggestions here for further reading. And this is, these are some craft piece, pieces. Um, this, uh, this thing called The Essay is Bouquet um, by Suzanne Cope is, is a piece that she wrote for creative nonfiction where she talks a little bit about um, hermit crab essays and what works about them and what doesn't. It's, it's a pretty good little piece, it's fairly short. Um, the Shared Space Between Reader and Writer, a case study is the one that Brenda Miller wrote about that rejection letter piece that I told you about. And so it's very interesting to read it because she kind of goes through the process by which she, um, she came to that particular piece. And then this is um, Tell It Slant, which is the book that I showed you earlier. And um, don't feel like you have to write these down. I can always send this to you guys. Um, and then, can you just put them in the chat? Can you copy them? Oh, that I, I probably can, yeah. Yeah, let me, let, let me I'll do that when we start chatting. Um, the examples, the further reading examples, um, th there's a whole bunch out there, but these are some of the best ones. Um, we regret to inform you is that one by Brenda Miller that goes with that brevity piece. Um, the Heart is a Torn Muscle is a really famous piece that you hear referred to a lot. It's, um, it uses like a medical, um, like a WebMD kind of medical um, piece. And she talks about, but it's about heartache. It's, it's, it's an excellent piece. It's very short. It's a it's a piece of flash fiction, uh, flash flash nonfiction. On shells is actually a piece that's about the craft of writing hermit crab essays, but it's a but it's but it's um, uh, done as sort of a naturalist piece. It's really interesting. And the Professor of Longing is by Jill Talbot. Talbot is a um, syllabus piece. And then finally, the Shell Game, which is this book right here, which came out a couple of years ago. And this is a collection of some of the best examples of um, hermit crab essays. And it also gives a little uh, kind of blurb at the beginning about the, the history of hermit crab essays. And this is the one that has like eight pages at the end of just ideas of different forms. So it, it's got great, and I read, I read something recently that talked about how somebody used that list as prompts, <laughs> right? They just took and they're like, oh, um, tombstones, I'm going to write some tombstone fiction, you know, nonfiction. And so, I mean, it's, it's a great place to look for ideas too. Um, especially if you kind of, you can only come up with, you know, six or seven forms. This like explodes your mind in terms of thinking about different kinds of forms. So um, I would love, and I'm going to check out the chat because I'm going to stop my share. And yeah, you can have the, you can have the whole PowerPoint. I'm fine with that. So Kristen, if you send it to me, I can post it on the website when we put up the recording of this. Yeah. Do you guys, is that good with that everybody? Good. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine with me. Um, yeah. Okay. I'm going to check you out chat. Hold on a minute.
Oh, Irene, yeah. I also like the numbers aren't left justified. It, it makes it makes it makes for a very different reading experience that I actually saw him read at um, AWP and he uh, um, he talked about the frustration that he feels when people try to argue that he's a prose poet and then other people are like no no, no you're an essayist you know you're a prose poet no you're an, you know they go they go back and forth and he said I don't care I like I just want to write good literature um, so he I mean it was a really that was super interesting to hear him sort of talk about that. So questions, revelations, anything else that anybody wants? Are you intrigued? I had a little revelation when you okay. were talking about. I, so um, I was thinking about, um, I've been, I've been writing a memoir about my mother. This I call it the mother death memoir, but I kind of gave up on it for a while because it was just like too emotional. Like, you know, like every day I felt like I was in the slough of despond, you know, over it. And um, when you were talking about something, I, I it was sort of related. But anyway, I had this idea of like prescriptions. I think you were talking about the query letters. Um, but I had this idea of like prescriptions throughout a person's life and even somebody that, you know, maybe worked like she worked in a health food store for a while and, you know, was prescribed lithium and anyway, and then at the end, you know, anyway, I just, I was thinking, wow, prescriptions might be a way to enter this and write about it. I think that it's so interesting. It's nice to see you, Lori. Um, it's oh, so, you. it's you. so interesting to think about how sometimes when we give our mind an intellectual puzzle to work on that frees up the emotional vulnerable side of ourselves you know what i mean and it it sort of like um it allows us to do work i think that we wouldn't otherwise do it intellectualizes something that feels really um painful or really difficult and so yeah. even if it's a place to start right? Like even if, if you're, you're finding that you just can't get anything on, on paper, um, this is a great technique for sort of saying, I'm going to put my mind to work on this puzzle on this, on this sort of like this intellectual thing. And I'm going to let that kind of take over. And the, the emotion becomes kind of secondary. Um, it's like you're tricking yourself. Well, I think I found that with, um, I was uh, supposed to write her obituary and I just kept faltering. And then I, you know, I started looking at different obituaries and saw the brutally honest obituary. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know? And then there was another one that was like the, like the life not lived, like, you know, what someone might have done what what they maybe you know talked about doing or wanted to do anyway it was a whole different form you know uh for the obituary that was like oh that opens up you know yeah so just i think looking out beyond what the normal form is you know helps a lot of times like so thank you this was great it's so funny that you, it's so funny that you mentioned that because um i gave i spoke at my grandmother's funeral and i naturally wrote something that was in five acts <laughs> you know like and and i mean I, I had been thinking about it for a long time because i knew that i knew that i was going to do this at some point um so i had already sort of been thinking about it but um but yeah, it, it, I had to, I had to do something with form in order to get myself through it. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that's a, it's, it, it can become a co almost a coping me mechanism, right? Um, yeah, that's super interesting. Anybody else? It's been a pleasure, you guys. I, I love being able to commune with writers. I miss it. I miss sort of like face-to-face. -face. Um, but I hope that this feels inspiring in terms of kind of giving you a new outlet um, or rethinking some of, the, some of the ways that you're currently approaching your writing. And again, this doesn't have to be in product. I guess this is where I want to end. This doesn't have to be about in product. This can be a process tool. 
right? This can be something that you do kind of as, as you're writing. Um, so, so use it that way um, because, because I think it can be really helpful um, as sort of a generative or, or even sort of a um, writer's block kind of, kind of activity. Um, and if you write anything really good, then send it to me. I'd love to read it. Lori knows, Lori knows I love getting sent stuff by people after, after um, workshops. So thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. You guys are too nice. Thank you. Such a good You're, this was okay. great. This was great. Good. I'm glad. Hi, Rebecca. Um, Y'all feel free to unmute and give, let's give um, Kristen a round of applause here in, in, in real world. Yay. Yay. I just wanted to say, Kristen, is because you're such a good teacher that, you know, um, we end up writing things that win awards after your workshops. So, I deserve very little fun. credit for that, Lori. Very little credit. I don't know about that. <laughs> it's always. Uh, but you do deserve some credit. You are the. Oh, thank you. That's really sweet. Yeah, it's always a pleasure uh, having you, Kristen. And uh, it's always insightful to me to um, all the cool stuff that you come up with here. Thank you. So um, as uh, Paige said, our next our, our next meeting, uh, August meeting is, is going to be um, Zoom. But then after that, we are back to um, in person at the library with snacks, apparently, right, Paige? Snacks, we can have snacks. That's the important part of the meeting <laughs> is to get snacks in. And then uh, I do want to encourage you to take a look at that August workshop with um, Dina Chadwell. Um, again, quite a, you know, our, we were able to, because we got a, a grant from Deschutes County, we're able to afford good workshop instructors uh, without passing that cost cost along to our members here. So, you know, $10 for a writing workshop is pretty unheard of. Um, August workshop will be Zoom, yes, uh, Mary. All right. Thank you all for coming. It's wonderful to see everyone. Um, really appreciate it. Really appreciate the community, the writing community here in Central Oregon. It certainly keeps me going and um, appreciate appreciate all of you. Appreciate all, all of you for being here. Thanks so much. That's Thanks, it. Mike. Have a great Bye. day. Have a great night. This has been part of Deschutes Book Library's virtual programming. Check out our YouTube page for all of this other great, fun, free content. We'll see you next time. <laughs>